um, that is best noted for probably uh, his work in the identification of UFOs, how, how to identify whether they're a hoax or a fraud. He worked with the, uh, the Meyer sightings back in the 70s and 80s, and he's here today to try to show us, or will show us, he brought his computer, show us how uh, uh, technology has changed and try to uh, enlighten us on, on uh, better ways of proving photos of UFOs, as well as other things, uh, aren't hoaxes. So if Smitty would roll that tape, and I'll get uh, myself back over there. We'll uh, meet Jim Delatos. Tom Welch was coordinating the scientific research in the United States. He coded this photograph, the jet fighter scene, and turned it over to science investigator and computer analyst Jim Dilatoso. Jim had analyzed over a dozen of the Meyer photographs, searching for strings, overlay, or double exposure trickery. None were found. Further analysis showed that the distance of the jet was over 2,000 yards away from the lens of the camera and the size of the craft was about 22 feet in diameter. But the most interesting discovery came when an energy field was detected, originating from the craft and creating an unusual pattern around it. Here Jim traces this field, showing the energy engulfing the Swiss Mirage fighter. The computer analysis report concluded. Hey, well, uh, I'm back. Jim, I want to welcome you. Hi, Ted. Good Thanks to Thanks for showing up. And you know uh, our co-host here, Jim know, Nichols. Jim. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of goodies have you brought for us today? You know, we brought you down here because, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I've been trying to get you for a long time. I usually go up and see you, but you've mm -hmm. you brought your computer. Are uh, you going to tell us a little bit of? Yeah. Let's start. Let's start back with the Meyer incident. Yes. How you were contacted and uh, how it went from there. Well, the Meyer case was uh, in the late 70s and was actually the first uh, case that I worked on that was a new case. Prior to that, I had been working on testing the, uh, quote, official photo set that APRO put out. APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization based in Tucson, Arizona. In Tucson here. Right. Um, Jim Lorenzen and Wendell Stevens brought me a set of about 30 photographs, I think really to see what my procedures were and were they a valid procedure. Prior to that, I had been working in film and television and transfer of scientific data to film and television. And I worked somewhat on the Shroud of Turin project and getting that uh, into a, a scientific data into a form that would be useful in a film. So I worked out a procedure, uh, investigated many other procedures, manufacturers, software, NASA, medical companies, a lot involved. Came up with a procedure, tested the pictures, got involved in the Meyer case uh, in about 1977. February of 1978 was when the next trip to Switzerland happened and a lot of new pictures uh, came back and we used our new procedures and tested the pictures. Now, when Wendell and, and APRO, uh, Jim Lorenzen, came to you, what did they want to know? Was there a procedure already in the, uh, I guess, in the files? W was something going on to being able to test photographs at this time, or was this something basically... Well, I didn't know what existed. Uh -huh. uh, at that time, uh, the uh, Navy and APRO and others had been testing photographs optically, uh, of course, since the 50s. A or an organization in Tucson, Ground Saucer Watch, uh, had developed a computer procedure, but I couldn't find enough about it, uh -huh. uh, what the procedures were that could be repeatable. So we really had to start at ground zero, build scale models, take photographs of miniature trucks and buses and cars and real cars and airplanes, and build a database that we could count on because people were counting on me to give them an accurate uh, set of facts. So, 
So there was no mm. test procedure. We had to devise one. So what, what exactly was your procedure? What, what were you looking for in these photographs that could okay. authenticate them or, or, or well, prove them false? Uh, <coughs> basically, you're, you are analyzing the edges of an object mm -hmm. first, uh, and you are analyzing the contour and the light scatter over the surface. Now, that's done with a computer. After film grain examination has been done, a microdensitometer, analysis of the film grain, is this, is this a dub? Have mm -hmm. two pictures, a slides been sandwiched one on top of the other, mm -hmm. etc. Okay, let's say you get all that out of the way. And there's a lot of procedures we can talk about, mm -hmm. about with that. But essentially, a large object and a small object have different properties, light and mm -hmm. edges. A camera takes an object in and out of focus and changes the properties of the edges, like these television studio cameras here. When an object goes in and out of focus, what's really happening, the edges are changing. And by measuring the nature of those edges, you can determine where the object sits in a, quote, depth of field. Mm -hmm. Light on an object. Let's just take... <coughs> You know, anything curved, my pen, this pen, the pen is all black, but because of the lights, it puts a, a white stripe on the light. Right. The larger the object, the smaller the percentage, the ratio of that dot, because the light's going to remain the same. Mm -hmm. So what that means is a large object, the sun, would create a small line relative to the entire surface, a small object, mm -hmm. the sun's still the same size. Mm -hmm. So the relative surface area uh, would be different on a small and a large object. All right, now this is what we saw in, in the, the Meyer film, the right. contact, that, uh, right. that you were able to take the Meyer photographs and uh, compare those to uh, a, a model of, of the, right. the beam ship. And your uh, procedure can determine which is the model right. and which is the, the, the full-scale craft. Yes. So through your procedures, you, you basically proved that, that Meyer was, in fact, photographing 30-foot, 20-foot objects that, uh, you know, that were actually there and not models or pay steps. Well, the conclusion that you just drew can be taken out of the test results. Mm -hmm. Our testing shows that it is a large object the pictures that we tested, mm -hmm. and there are many other photographs in the Meyer case, but the pictures that we tested show a large object 21 feet mm -hmm. in diameter at a great distance from the camera. Now, whether that's piloted by extraterrestrials or right. pilots from the U.S. Air Force, mm -hmm. we can't tell because mm -hmm. right. they didn't just the stick their arms out and wave. But one of the issues, uh, one of the major detractions of the Meyer case is, uh, is that, well, he was just photographing models, that he had models in his barn and so on and so forth. Yes. But what you were, what you, your analysis showed that at least some of the pictures were, in fact, large objects yes. photographed at some distance from the camera. That's correct. They're mm -hmm. large objects. Okay. And we published reports about it. Right. Uh, detractors of the case uh, have never published reports of their analysis and their procedure and what equipment they used mm -hmm. and what the software was. And perhaps their opinion is valid. They may mm -hmm. be dignified scientists, but they mm -hmm. certainly did not do clear scientific work in analysis mm -hmm. of UFO pictures mm -hmm. and the Meyer case, mm -hmm. the detractors I'm talking about. Right. So uh, what, what surprised me, because I didn't really know, I'm watching this uh, tape, and I know Jim, um, that he has other uh, photographs that he's, he's uh, worked with. But there was a, like an aura, a force field around that, mm -hmm. and it actually entrapped that, the, what was it, the, that other plane that was going by there? There was another yeah, well, plane inside there that seemed like there was a radiation or a force field around that? Uh, that's exactly right. It seemed like there was. Mm -hmm. um, that photograph and three others um, I worked on with Marcel Vogel, who is a research scientist at IBM. And we theorized that there may be energy in the film grain, in the film crystals that can be released by electromagnetic stimulation. Mm -hmm. You have to start with the negative or a negative made from the negative. 
can't be a negative, a print, and then a negative. It has to be a piece of plastic, light passes through it, mm -hmm. makes a new piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. The idea is scientifically sound, that energy is captured in crystals and by stimulation, electromagnetic or ultrasound stimulation, energy is released, like a tuning fork. Mm -hmm. A440 on a piano makes the tuning fork vibrate. So you can release energy from the crystals and new energy is released and a new image on a charge coupled plate is created. It is that image that we tested. And it seemed that there was an energy field around the craft. So you were coming, you didn't, uh, in your analysis, you didn't just inadvertently come across this, this image that showed the field. You, you were actually looking for, you had a concept that perhaps there was an energy field around this craft, yes. and is there a way we can maybe find it yes. or record it here or see that it's been recorded? While the world was trying to debunk the photographs, we mm -hmm. knew that they were real and had already gone on to the next step. Mm -hmm. We were not in the UFO community where we felt like mm -hmm. we had to defend ourselves. Right. right. We just got on with it. It was mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I was on a mission from God, <laughs> you know, to test the pictures. Mm -hmm. So uh, we continued and, and retested the pictures and came up with mm -hmm. other methods because mm -hmm. I guess I have to admit, it was a little bit disconcerting when people say, oh, they don't know what they're doing. They missed something. Mm -hmm. They're, mm -hmm. they, whatever they said, you know. Right. Uh, so we proceeded with methods and procedures in an attempt to really understand what this was. I'd never seen pictures like this. I worked in science and rock mm -hmm. and roll and video mm -hmm. and, you know, when you first see those pictures, it's, uh, it's disorienting. Mm -hmm. Now, have you taken this? Per, you you continue to do photo analysis of other mm -hmm. UFO sightings. Yes. Are you finding the similar energy patterns in other cases? We have. Yes. Uh -huh. Has the technology advanced uh, quite a bit more that that uh, uh, you could go back to the Meyer case again and yes. take the and and without a doubt now, uh, of course, and as as technology progresses, there will always be more technology. But yes. Uh, do it again. In a, in, a, in a sense, do it again to uh, prove that you're right again to the naysayers? I do it again all the time. They're, they are demo pictures that live in our PCs. Mm -hmm. The computing power that we had available to us in the late 70s, 50000 100000 $500,000 systems using mainframes and supercomputers, that power is now on a PC. The image processing software that we used to operate on a Gould 9000 mm -hmm. now lives in Photo Styler and Photoshop for a couple of hundred dollars running on a PC. Mm -hmm. Same software though, just because it's inexpensive does not change the validity of the testing. Mm -hmm. so you can test pictures now if you have a, a proper scanner at 600 to 1200 dots per inch, that's the resolution. Mm -hmm. For people at home, your television is about 400 dots, though it's supposed to be 500 dots. So if you have a 12-inch TV, it's 500 dots per foot. Mm -hmm. You need to scan a picture at about 1,000 dots per inch to really be able to analyze mm -hmm. that. And we do that all the time. <coughs> and uh, the Meyer photographs from 1976 to 1980 are absolutely a large object piloted by a large being, <laughs> Let me stop five you to there. six feet tall. Now, did you ever, from that period of time, did you ever find a consistency, like a trademark that, uh, I'm sure that there, what was there, six different mm -hmm. crafts, different types of craft? Five or six. Did well, one show up consistently and you could say, yes, that one was three years ago because it has the same characteristics as the other one. Does it have like a fingerprint when it comes to cameras? There's two categories of characteristics. Um, one is the relative proportions in the craft, height to width, dimensions, the mathematics involved in the proportions of the craft. That's one set of characteristics. Uh, the various rings, if you measure their diameters and can piece it together, they will add up 
to a linear length that is directly a proportionate of the center. We can get into that some other time, but it's, mm -hmm. it's very interesting. In testing pictures sometimes now, that's what I go for first. I check the proportions. Mm -hmm. The other very interesting thing and a commonality factor is the pulsing of the light, the colors of the light that are around the craft if it's photographed at night. There's a white color, a specific blue-white color, and an orange color, an orange-amber color. Regardless of the kind of film, the photographer, after we've color corrected, sometimes even if we don't color correct, I can see it right away. The pattern, the relationship of the brightest hot spot in the center of the photograph and out to the edge. Some of the better photographs that we've analyzed are now in a computer program that'll be out in just a couple weeks. In fact, it's, it's out in some places now that has hundreds of photographs in it and measure trends and characteristics. And uh, the ongoing characteristics are what's important. I, I, I want to ask you then, so you cannot personally verify that the, that the, Meyer, the entire Meyer case is is true or false because you were basically uh, on just what maybe a hundred or fifty uh, of the photographs is what you physically uh, went over and checked and verified? Well I've been exposed to a few hundred photographs in the video and film of mm -hmm. course and other samples but we really tested in detail four photographs. Well, the reason why I'm saying this is because I just, uh, uh, you know the same gentleman as I do, uh, Glenn, and uh, he called mm -hmm. me up on the phone the other day and he says he has absolute proof, absolute proof it's on the table that the Meyer incident is nothing but a hoax. Then he should stop selling the books and selling the videotapes and using the logo in his brochure. Well, that's kind of what I said. It's uh, heinous that scientists and researchers do that. I don't want to hear about any of this from these people sometimes. Mm -hmm. I want to see the published reports. That's I want what to I see wanted the to science. Say. That's what mm -hmm. I want to I want to see the numbers and the software Absolutely. because people can say anything they want to. And that's what I put mm -hmm. him to the test, too. I, I says, I'm mm -hmm. a little tired of this, too, Glenn. Yeah. I says, if you have it, show it. Right. If you don't, then leave it alone. Leave it die. Yeah. Glenn's a good guy. I like him. He's just listening to yet another definitive UFO photo expert who doesn't publish papers and doesn't reveal what the software is and what the hardware is. And mm -hmm. it's not that hard to do. If someone was really doing it, they would step up and say, guess what? I have a target board and I have a PC and I have a scanner and we've looked at the edges and I've done this and I've done that and you wanna know what the software is really? Okay. <laughs> Uh, it can be done. Oh yeah. And all that someone has to do is truly want to know what it is and how it's done, and they can find out and test the pictures for themselves. Let's let's skip right on over to the um, Jorge Martin case, the Puerto Rico case. You did mm -hmm. uh, an extensive work. You yes. uh, presented a paper. You gave it to Jorge. He presented it at uh, Mufon, and yet they still there are certain people that rise up there and say this piece of paper is worthless. Yes. But I was with you at the time that we scanned the photograph, and I can't remember, it was 2,100 pixels an inch or something? 2,400. 24 was outrageous. It was, it was amazing how this was done. And you looked for uh, the cut and paste type of a thing. You had the, the, the machinery that, that is capable of it now. Identifying. Now, this is the photograph that had the, the disc in Puerto Rico and the, the Tomcat, the Navy right. Tomcat. The Navy. So four you, photographs. Four photographs, and, and you examined both the saucer and the, yes. the Tomcat and everything, you know. Well, we did even more than that. We did a flight path simulation. Uh -huh. uh, what would be required for the Tomcat to leave formation mm -hmm. and make passes on the UFO and to sweep its wings, go into stall speed, and move around the UFO for that time of day, the lighting, the edges, the shading. It's a Tomcat, and it's a UFO, and none of those people that are detractors have tested the pictures. Mm -hmm. If they really, if they really were scientific about it, I'm in the phone book, they'd call me up. they talk about the procedures. It's just a way that the UFO community operates they don't want the you to become an I, an unidentified object to become an identified object there wouldn't be any reason to have these 
Boy Scout meetings anymore. Or, uh, pardon me, scientific uh, proceedings, uh, pr uh, conventions. Like, That's so uh, funny. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a clue of what you're talking about. By the way, I want to get this in, too. This is a good time to bring this up. Um, you guys out there, there's going to be some good, good um, investigators coming to Tim Beckley's conference. It's going to be up in, uh, where is it going to be? Up in your hometown, Phoenix. Phoenix. Phoenix, Jim will be up there. Uh, some of the people in the audience will be up there. Uh, Jenny Randall, some of the other people. So uh, it's the 24th of September, uh, that whole weekend. Uh, there's going to be some other interesting people up there also. So if you get a chance, check it out and find out. Like the band will be there too. Oh, right? the band's going to be band there too. The band will be there. I want to also introduce the, uh, a band maybe right at the end. So uh, Shane or one of you guys, let me know when there's five minutes left, and I'll bring Jerry mm -hmm. up here and, and the band up here, and we'll introduce the band and play some That'd of the tunes. Good. That was the opening of the... Um, uh, we changed the opening, mm -hmm. so if, you, if the music was a little different, that was, your, that was the band, the UFO band. Well, that so. was shot on a home camera last week. It's a, it's a high hate tape. It's not exactly our no, new no, it music was the, video. It was the no, band. No, right. it was the music. We the had music. the music. We had the music as the mm -hmm. opening on it. Right. Um, all right, well, let's get to what you have here. Uh, uh, if okay. I can tell Smitty or something, if we can go ahead and uh, okay, utilize well, it's the screen. A, it's a 486 uh, portable computer. I have a target board in it. Um, we network PCs over the phone lines. Uh, in and out of mainframes and supercomputers. Our main day-to-day -day activity now is moving video data through high-speed networks in and out of supercomputers for video on demand, which is part of image processing and a whole lot of other things. But in order to see what we do here, uh, I'll have to be able to look at the monitor myself because when I go into the video mode... So you want Smitty to bring up the, yeah, the to full bring screen? Yeah, right. Okay. So Are you there? Look at Jim. Yeah. Yeah. I'm typing it in. Oh, yeah. So we're there. Whoop. Well, it's going to scan like that for a moment while it resets its mode. I'll come back on. Don't be alarmed. It's just chips breathing. Mm -hmm. Well, you they could, took a deep breath there. You could turn the monitor just a little bit so I can uh, actually see to operate. That's very good. Okay, explain okay. what you're doing here, Jim. Well, we're going into a standard Windows program. Some of the applications that we have developed run in a, uh, an Intel clone mode. It used to be IBM clone. It's really an Intel clone based on the processor that's in it. And it's a Windows program. And we've written some applications for people at home to be able to uh, look at UFO photographs. So we'll look at that first and study a UFO database. It'll be in stores everywhere. This is going to be on a CD-ROM and also on floppies? Well, also on disk and on CD-ROMs, yes. Yeah, I have the... So uh, what we have, let's see if I can... Aha, uh -huh, I can't see my own menu there. It goes just a hair off the screen. Well, we'll try to guess where it is while the rest of the program comes up. It has a map of the world uh, to show where the different sightings are, a sightings parameter uh, selection here. You can decide what years you want to check. We're searching now from 1950 to 1993, but we could go all the way back into antiquity. What kind of sighting? Close encounters one, two, and three. For now, let's just do sightings. Photographic evidence only, no death or injury involved, abduction, psychic phenomena, movies, multiple witnesses, <laughs> multiple UFOs, or cattle mutilations. Let's go just for photographic evidence. It's going to check the database now and give us the uh, number of matches. Now, the hourglass here means that it's actually searching, and the map of the world will uh, locate all the actual sightings that it has found as actual matches. That's in Brazil, isn't it? That one there? Right. Well, some of these uh, are uh, historically important because they uh, have established trends of different uh, sightings from around the world. 
Let's go to the next one. So you can see right here, it says the number of matches is 201. And uh, it's going to light up on the map. Give a description. This one is from Uruguay, if I'm reading it correctly. Yeah. Uh, and there's a description over here of the event and what actually happened. Who was the, uh, where did the, this information come from? Who was the main programmer on it to be able to get this, this type of information and program it? Dr. David White, who is a uh, pretty well-known uh, computer programmer um, and photo database creator. Some of his other projects include, uh, well, in his company, which is SMC of Phoenix, uh, Body Works, AutoMap, PC Globe, some very popular, pretty well-known programs. Okay. Uh, the updates will be available on phone lines. If you have a modem, you can dial up and get an update of uh, some of the new cases, or for investigators, we have created other modules so you can actually use your home computer, scanner, fax machine, a variety of communications formats to be able to ship pictures and case file formats around to each other. How about video? Well, video, if you have a target board or a uh, Creative Labs video blaster, which is only a couple of hundred dollars, um, you can scan home video direct into the camera. You could become a UFO electronic researcher at home for about a thousand dollars. Well, this is, is this for libraries also? Would this be for libraries, library? for schools, for uh, scientists, engineers, researchers, uh, scientists in the conventional scientific community that secretly want to know about UFO mm -hmm. investigations, but it's been sufficiently discredited that they have to do it in a in the closet. In the closet. Well, uh, we're, we're having these people uh, probably within the two weeks there are going to come on and demonstrate all of this, this type of software and explain where this comes from, how, how, uh, how it was devised, what Very the good. reason were. They contacted Jim and I and they wanted to know if we'd be interested in it. And we said, yeah, sure. Come right down. Come, come right down. <laughs> yes, very good. Come right down. Now, will this, this, does this help you in doing anything uh, in your investigation to make sure that photos are photos? Not in this. This is for uh, the general public to have access to photographs. This is just an archive. It's an archive. Right. It's a uh -huh. database. It's a library. It's a filing cabinet. But they, it's not an analysis No, format. it's not an no. analysis tool. The photographs that we mm -hmm. test then go back to Wendell Stevens or over to Dave White or over to Michael, the president of the software company, and they decide if it's a case of interest to the public and then it gets programmed into the updates. Uh, the analysis tools that we use on PCs, I, I use um, well, a professional uh, image processing package from a company in uh, New Mexico, uh, programmers from Los Alamos, and that program is not expensive. It's about $500. Used to be 50000 mm -hmm. Photo styler, it's a couple hundred dollars. Now that videos come out, and, and everybody has a video camera, right. it seems mm -hmm. like, is it harder or easier to identify a, a hoaxer or a, or a photograph or, uh, I don't know, a piece of... Uh, film, it isn't film, a piece of tape. Well, video isn't, uh, isn't very easy to analyze because the resolution is so poor. 400 lines, 200 lines, 500 lines across the entire image. Whereas in photography, we could, for all intents, say that photography is really 8,000 lines. So when you transfer a photographic image to the computer, it becomes a thousand lines per inch or 500 lines per inch. Video is between 500 and 75 dots per inch. So film, the old film, the old Super 8 would have been much better to oh, take a picture better. of. Absolutely. Because uh, of the uh, way of uh, the emulsion. Right. Uh, okay, now, if you have to instruct somebody out there that is driving down the street or wakes up and hears a beep in their head, 
shouldn't they get a piece of landscape as much as possible in the frame of the picture? Isn't that what you would like of to course. see? Of course, so we have a reference. So we can compare the edges of the unknown object to a tree, a rock, so we either know how big an object is, like a cactus, or we know how far away something is, like a signpost. We have to compare all the edges in the photograph of known things to the property of the edges in the unknown, whether it's an airplane or a car or a UFO, mm -hmm. so we can rank how far away objects are by the property of the edges. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of simple to do. Now, Bruce Maccabee is another person that, that, that seems to be uh, in the limelight of uh, uh, investigating photographs. I think he does a lot of work for, for MUFON. Uh, do you guys use the same type of, is there a standard? Is there a standard in identifying photographs? What? Is there a standard <laughs> with Bruce Maccabee? Yeah, okay. I know. With I know Bruce Maccabee. Uh, there is no published standard. There is nothing that MUFON. I've only talked to Bruce Maccabee on the phone. He's probably a very fine gentleman. I don't consider his procedures scientific at all. It's a bunch of hoo ha. And uh, if it was a scientific procedure, the papers would be requested from me, he would publish his papers, and uh, uh, the people at MUFON just... Oh, I'm not saying that, Jim. I'm not, I'm not putting uh, anybody, uh, because there's, there's okay. Paul Nathan that's doing it. I was just Bob wondering... Bob Nathan. Uh, is it Bob Nathan? Yes. Uh, is there a standard, is there a guideline that everybody should have to go by and then go out from there? <clears throat> they should use our standard and then they should study that and go adopt another one. Until you've built as many models as we have tested, I mean, literally, toy airplanes, larger ones, parked on the ground, flying in the air, moving database after database, and have controls that you know what to work with, you really can't assess something and say, oh, that's a small model, I know how it was done. It's not scientific. And not that everything has to be scientific in this to the hilt, but it's how you arrive at the truth. And we want to know what the truth is. Are there people from other worlds flying, remarkable flying machines and coming down to Earth? Mm -hmm. We want to know that. I don't want people bluffing me that they've tested pictures and that we've made mistakes when we really haven't. What a horrible thing to do to people out there that really want to know if people from another planet are coming here, for Art. amateur scientists to say that they've tested pictures when they haven't, and to say that a picture is true when it isn't, and to debunk the ones that are true, all of that. Well, that's been one of the problems in, in the UFO investigating oh, field, that, that, that photographs, it's been, you know, the cliche that photographs right. are, are not useful uh, tools as, as, as evidence. You're saying that, that a photograph is a, a useful tool. You have mm -hmm. found a technique where, whereby actual photographs are useful tools in investigation. Yes, Through they scientific are. method. And mm -hmm. that's what I was trying right. to ask if there were guidelines to go by, and Jim just said the guidelines that they've, because there, were, there wasn't any at the time that, mm -hmm. that, that he did it, and yes. scientifically made the guidelines. I think still, still, this is a stigma that, that goes w in, in the community that, that well, UFO, UFO photographs are not reliable. End of story. Yeah. And, and you're saying that they can be shown to they be reliable. They can be, if uh, mm -hmm. dealt with in a scientific procedure, such mm -hmm. as a polygraph test mm -hmm. or a voice stress analysis. Mm -hmm. They must be interpreted scientifically and must be done in a repeatable procedure. Mm -hmm so that uh, another scientist can follow that same procedure and get the same results. Mm -hmm. That's what makes good science. So what's the next step? Where are we going with this? Are you working on any new cases right now or any new photographs that, that, that you can talk about? Well, I've been, uh, in the last uh, year or so, studying photographs from Mexico and South America, Puerto Rico, and photographs taken at night. I have a new interest in photographs taken at night the color patterns and the movement patterns. Now you're saying photographs. Well, photographs and video, okay. imagery. Okay. The most interesting pictures um, that I've seen uh, have not been uh, released yet, but um, yeah, I could probably talk about those. Uh, in fact, maybe they have been released. 
you know, I don't know everything that reaches the media. But the photographs are of a uh, UFO during uh, Cinco de Mayo, during the celebration in Cinco de Mayo. And uh, multiple videographers mm -hmm. took images of a UFO during an air parade. Mexican helicopters fly into the image, bank mm -hmm. and go away, mm -hmm. while a UFO drops straight down out of the sky, while jets begin to fly in formation, and the UFO falls right through them. Right. Hovers, moves, and begins to fly at great speed, moves, well, in unconventional ways. And, and so isn't some of that footage in Messengers from Destiny? Uh, Messengers of Destiny. Yes, right. it is. This yeah. is video taken from another angle by another videographer. Okay. Yes, and, and you've also um, examined the uh, the videos from Mexico City during the solar eclipse. Mm -hmm. was, okay. What What are your findings from that? Well, the image quality is poor in that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting object. Uh, what I've really been studying is whether or not it could be Venus. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, there were some that, uh, that the elders were showing on there uh, that had a similarity to the same, or the same reaction to the similarity of one of the beam ships that, uh, that were... Uh, in the Meyer in case. In the Meyer case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that or know anything about no, that? I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, uh, it had the same characteristics. and had the, they, they were talking about the cupella that was up on top of it and how they could see that and the way it, mm -hmm. the way it moved and wobbled. Mm -hmm. Now, how about, were you involved in any of the Meyer case in the film, the actual movie of the film where it flies around the tree and back around the tree? Yes. And it's the same type of an operation that uh, you uh, look for as if it was just a photograph. You just do one frame at a time, isn't yes. that right? And look for the center of gravity and look for the center of the, the apex of the pendulum if it was suspended by a string and attempt to follow the movement if it was hanging on a pendulum and circulating around the tree as has been said um, what would the arc have to be and what would the movement it'd be impossible to do it mm -hmm. uh, on a fish line by the way to uh, a television producer Bruce Maccabee did indeed admit to a producer uh, at Unsolved Mysteries Bob Kiviat that he indeed never really tested the Meyer photographs well, I never knew he did. I was talking more on the uh, the golf brief stuff that he's done, and his name always comes to the forefront when you talk with MUFON. It's their probably their go-to guy anyway. And I just wanted mm -hmm. to know if there was some st some commonality between your testing and his testing. MUFON is well, we will collaborate sometime. You never yeah. know. At the moment, I don't consider it scientific mm -hmm. at all. MUFON has, has put a lot of distance between themselves and, and the Meyer case. Oh, I, I, I realize that. I realize that for for whatever reason they. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They've seen to the grab a hold of the golf briefs thing and worked with in, it. In, in the, the film Contact, there's, uh, there's some computer imagery that uh, I believe that you've done where it shows the craft and counter-rotating lights uh, on the craft. Mm -hmm. Now, is that, is, is that the, uh, a, a light configuration that, that Meyer reported? No, we studied the uh, motion picture film, mm -hmm. which he shot on 8 millimeter. Mm -hmm. and enhanced frame by frame the eight millimeter film mm -hmm. and recreated the reflections mm -hmm. uh, on the craft. I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that those are light sources. I mm -hmm. think that they are reflections. Mm -hmm. What it appears to be are pencil thin rods that all move up and down, move up and down like this and create a wave motion that mm -hmm. moves around the craft. Mm -hmm. And then that's around the, uh, the outer periphery around around the the outer craft. Perimeter, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Um, there's another set of photographs from the Meyer case where it showed the craft, a, a set of stills, this is not, not the movie footage, mm -hmm. where the, sh the craft in a sequence goes right. around very closely to uh, a, a pine tree. Did you uh, have opportunity mm -hmm. to examine that film? Looks suspicious, doesn't it? Well, one, one of the, exactly. <laughs> yes, it does. One of the, uh, the main suspicious. detractors is that this is, this is a potted miniature tree and, and, a, and a model is being, you know, placed around it. What, what was your conclusion of the examination Can't of that photograph? Can't be that. Because of the characteristics of the reflection off of the surface of the craft, the properties of the edges compared to the edges in the house and the edges on the tree. That's what you do edge enhancement for. Mm -hmm. If there's that many objects in the photograph, you test for them all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's painstaking. It can take 
hundreds of hours to run all the filters on one photograph. Hundreds of hours. And I was not getting a suntan while all that was happening. I was well, sitting by the computer. Didn't Wendell uh, also give, give you uh, a known fake Yes. Uh, to see whether or not you could find this without your knowledge, find out that the, if this was, That's correct. was a fake? And, uh, and I determined it was a model. Determined that it was a model. Yes. Now, you, I don't know if you have or not, there was uh, some later pictures that come off that we call the wedding cake the, of the Meyer incident. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in any of those? Not in the early stages. The uh, one with the balls on it? Yeah. But can you comment on those at all? Or are you, you going back looking. through that? It's very odd looking. What we were able to determine was that um, Well, it's odd. In some of the photographs, it appears to be four to six feet in diameter. And in some of the other photographs, over 20 feet in diameter. I did not have a clear enough set of images to actually do the testing. I needed to have uh, no more than second generation copies of that. And uh, it just doesn't look right some of the photographs. And, and I have to say that uh, I, I do look at photographs and go by the, what I feel about them sometimes, mm -hmm. but then I have to abandon that and use the procedures to right. test the pictures. Mm -hmm. And some of these procedures are what satellite technology uses, what spot imaging technology uses, uh, cruise missile technology, because I do work in aerospace. Mm -hmm. And uh, a cruise missile can tell if something is a tennis ball or a quarter or a basketball or the moon because they all look like a disc out in front of the missile. There's many other software utilities involved, but uh, we know how to test for these properties in an image. And the wedding cake photographs with all the balls on it looks funny but tests out correct. The other interesting thing about that image is that uh, Robin Shellman, who works for General Dynamics and the uh, Navy in Groton, Connecticut, tested many years ago the sounds of the Meyer craft, mm -hmm. not knowing what it came from, and reconstructed a model of what it would take to generate those sounds. And he drew what looks like that craft. Well, listen, this is pretty interesting. What time is it? We, we go out for 10, isn't it? Yeah, we've got about five minutes. we got about five uh, minutes. Yes. Real quick. Real quick. Uh, mentioning, Real quick. mentioning your background with aerospace and NASA and so forth, have you had opportunity to, uh, to examine the footage of the SDS-48? No. Yeah. Would you Michael like to? Malin has. Oh, okay. Yes, and I have the report okay. on that. Yes. Very okay. interesting report. Right. Michael examined the uh, Meyer case photographs. Mm -hmm. Thinks up. that they're real. Would there be any? Upstairs. Would there be any reason for you to, uh, like you said, you're not in the, uh, um, uh, or maybe you are. Are you in the the, the, the the business to investigate these these crafts? Would there be any interest to to reinvestigate, reopen the files with the new equipment, and go back over these? I have been doing that. I'm not in the business of doing it, though. I've never taken any money for testing any photographs, or taken any money for being involved in any media projects. I do it because I want to know and I've developed a responsibility towards a lot of people that look to me to tell them what, yeah, they, what they think I think about it. Well, uh, caller, we're not going to, I'm sorry, but I can't, I, I, I can't take this call because I want to get uh, some of these people in. You will be at the Blue Millennium tomorrow, is that correct? That's right. And from uh, 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock? Mm -hmm. And you'll have uh, some of you... Some of the computers, computers and, and people be able to right. uh, ask any questions. Now, right. if somebody did have a, a, a photo, could they get in touch with you somehow or, or they can no? They get in touch with you. They get in touch with me, and yes. then, of course, I can get right. back with you. I'd love this. to have uh, detractors come visit us tomorrow. Skeptics? Skeptics. There must be skeptics in Tucson. Oh, there's all kinds of skeptics yeah, in right. Tucson. Yeah, right. right now, do you, is there something that you have, Jim? Well, we, uh, we probably should plug our program tomorrow at, the, uh, at your church. Well, yeah, we're going to be, in fact, it was on the radio. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to give a, uh, a lecture just before Jim's lecture at the Blue Millennium. Mm. I'm going to give a lecture at, 
Uh, your church. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Okay, uh, that's your church, and that's uh, 5956 East Pima. Uh, for more information, you can call 296-4059. And what are you going to be talking on some earth changes? Yeah, stuff? from 1.30 to 4, I'll be speaking at, at your church also on uh, earth changes. And then you're going to be at... Uh, speaking at... The, the blue church. millennium, the, <laughs> <laughs> blue, the blue millennium, and there are there is a lot of people that come in. If they happen to have photos, maybe we can get to that also. I want to bring Jerry. We haven't, we don't have any mics. Can we get the band, uh, mm -hmm. the members of the band, Jerry come on and up? Susan. Jerry and Susan, come up. Uh, you know, kind of uh, if you can. Uh, <clears throat> I don't, we have we a don't scientific have uh, multimedia rock and roll band, and we. Show Just UFO come on up, pictures. Guys. Come yeah, on up. come on up here. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I mm -hmm. didn't bring any chairs, but if you can squeeze in here and let me mm -hmm. hit the, Susan, you need a chair. And you want? Do you want to get mm -hmm. down here? Tell me real quick, you guys, how this happened and what happened and how you guys got together and what are you doing? We saw your rock and roll guitar the last time you were on the show. You saw that? You brought it here. Oh, well, that's right. Mm -hmm. I wonder where you might have seen it from. You're going to have to kind of talk loud because you guys aren't mic'd. You're just going to have to talk into mine. Okay, so what happened? How'd this get together? Um, Who wants to speak? Jerry? <laughs> okay, here we go. I have a mic now. Briefly, what happened is that uh, we're all three lecturers, and it seems that there was something that occurred for each one of us that gave us the idea it sure would be nice to do some of this with music involved because we all love music. Okay, real quick, what do you lecture on? What is your? Uh, what do you do when you lecture? I lecture on my my own encounters, uh, the beings that I've I've run into. I had about five years of um, meetings with them, and some other things too. I also lecture on aspects of their influence upon higher consciousness for us. Okay, Susan, what do you? Uh what do I? You, I'll speak into your mic. <laughs> yeah, speak into my mic. So, what do you um, do with the band? Do you are you a percussionist, right? I'm percussionist. I play electronic and acoustic drums, and drifting more into the electronic end of it. But and you lecture. Yours is the Angels of Garibaldi. Uh, I have been lecturing on the Angels of Garibaldi, which is my contact experiences. But I've kind of moved out of that, and I'm working on a research project in conjunction with a couple of other researchers at. Um, Simon Fraser University, it's based on a, uh, that's in British Columbia, it's based on a hypothesis that I've developed as a result of my research in neurochemistry actually over the last few years and it relates to, uh, I call it the chemical contact. Similar to what you've lectured here in town with. Uh, that's right, I have lectured here in, at the library and at the uh, Holodome. And for those of you that you uh, know, Susan has been also a guest host on UFOAZ uh, many right. times. Jim, what do you, what do you do behind a band? Mm-hmm. Yes. Real quick. I play keyboards and I play computer graphics and animation. So this three is the band? Three is the band. And uh, is there going to be discs? I mean, computer discs or tapes? Or well, we have a, an interactive CD that comes out um, in the winter and a music CD and uh, uh, with computer graphics and animation and music. We're rolling out. So when they can see you guys up in Phoenix along with us. We'll be up at Phoenix mm -hmm. also the 24th. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in the lectures, these people will be lecturing and in the band. It's a great time, guys. You really got to be there. Thanks a lot. <laughs>